I am going to start um, with some introduction to, as I said, to the work that we've been doing and then also to present a pilot study that we did a few years ago here in the foothills and the findings from that work that really generated new questions that are being followed up um, by Raphael and by Teresa who will be presenting as part of the next section as well. So I wanted to go back and ask you to reflect for a second. Everybody in the room can do this. If you close your eyes and think for a minute, back to when you were taking your first undergrad courses, when you were learning about forests and fire and disturbance and dynamics of vegetation and succession, what were you told was the role of fire in driving forest dynamics and succession? When I think back to my ecology degree, what I was told was that forest fires are these big disturbances that have severe effects. They tend to destroy the forest around us, take away all the living above ground biomass, and start a new successional sequence. So the fire is going to initiate succession, and then the forest will regenerate with pioneer species and it will shift to mid-successional composition and the stand will develop and the crown, crown will close. We'll get changes in structure through time and eventually we'll end up with late successional shade tolerant species that are in a climax state at equilibrium with the climate. And that this successional trajectory could be set back to the start by yet another big fire disturbance. That model of succession and disturbance is still one that shows up in our introductory textbooks. I'm amazed at how often it shows up and is a topic that we're still teaching to our first and second year students. And what I want to do is take that paradigm, that concept of how fire works and how it drives vegetation dynamics and add to it the tremendous amount of complexity, the additional information that we now know about fire and vegetation dynamics that has been learned over the last several deca decades and how new paradigms have emerged to guide our, both our understanding and then how we apply that knowledge. Because how we view fire and its driving of vegetation determines how we manage our forests using that system, what kind of fire management we choose to, to implement, and also how we conserve or protect areas that we think are valuable to us um, and need some protection or that we want to have as representative ecosystems over time. And so how we answer that question has strong implications for how we move forward in a whole range of natural resource and conservation modes. The stand replacing fires that we typically see on the landscape, you can see here one that has burned um, through the foothills region. And it's a severe fire that has left some island remnants and some patches, but it has some very distinct edges. And so this is the type of fire, these stand replacing fires, are the ones that Zev was talking about a few minutes ago, that we can use this technique of stand origin mapping, where we can use those distinct boundaries between where the fire did or did not burn. We can draw in polygons and we can determine the age of the forests in each of the patches to determine when the last fire burned at those points. We can create those distributional curves that Zab described where we look at the proportion of the landscape on the y-axis at different, that burned at different points in time. So we have a cumulative distribution there. We can do some math and magic on it and we can create a straight line and that straight line tells us about the fire cycle, giving us that, that indicator here that this particular data set depicted in the diagram is for a fire cycle of 100 years. So here we have a landscape that would be burning on average every 100 years with a stand replacing fire. This technique is one that really was well developed and has been implemented throughout Western Canada, in particular in our Rocky Mountain parks. And Ben Wagner et al. wrote a really elegant paper in 2006 where they summarized 700 years of time since fire data, these really rich data sets that come out of our national parks. So here they were looking at a data from the Rocky Mountain National Parks using these very large data sets that had been accumulated through many studies through time. And what they found was the east side parks, the ones further to the east on the map here, they had fire cycles or fire return intervals of about 60 to 70 years in the several hundred years prior to 1740. But then we had um, a fairly significant shift in the fire regime, and in particular, um, 
between 1740 and the 1940s that had extended out to, the, to 175 years and then very little fire being observed after the 1940s, not enough to actually come up with a rotation or, or period for that time. The west side parks, they saw a slightly different shift in the timing of the change in the cycles. Prior to the 1840s, there was a 90 year fire return interval and then since the 1840s, fires had been much less frequent and insufficient observations to really put together um, the type of data set that would allow them to calculate a fire cycle. So significant changes in the fire cycle, significant differences west and east um, in our national parks, using very rich and long-term data set. Now one of the things that I quite find, or coin find, find quite fascinating about these data sets is if we go back to the original sources, Many of the authors of those, of those data sets were creating stand origin or time since fire maps, but they were also noting in their field notes and in their observations in the parks, fire scars embedded within the stands that they were dating. So they were telling us that within these forests, they could put an age on the forest for stand origin, but they also knew that there was other types of fires that had burned there. So if we come back to the stand origin map, this system, is aiming to understand fire cycle and fire frequency and burning rates. Those are the metrics that we can derive and they're describing then a high severity fire regime. The major assumption is then that the stand replacing fires are the dominant type of fire there. And that's explicit. And it's in fact stated very explicitly and discussed in the Ben Wagner paper from 2006. So what do we do then if we have fires of a range of severity? We've talked already today about mixed severity effects and we look in these same landscapes where this has been quantified and we see um, evidence of variability of fire in the past. So you've seen this picture as well from Zeb and so where we have stand maintaining fires, these ones that are occurring at low and variable severity, we can get then a very different fire regime where individual fires can be patchy and have different severities within an individual fire, but also at an individual location in the landscape if we can build our history back through time, we would expect in a mixed severity regime for the fires that have repeated at that site to have sometimes been of low, sometimes of moderate, and sometimes of higher effects. And those would be left in, um, or evidence of those different fires drilling back through time at any given location can give us evidence then of the mixed versus high severity components. And so the mixed severity components, the lower severity aspect of the regime comes from the fire scar record. The non-lethal um, fires leave scars embedded in the tree rings and through cross-dating we can get annually resolved fire scars on there. And by cross-dating I'm talking about matching the patterns from living to dead trees so that um, we're not having false or missing rings embedded in the tree ring series itself giving us um, inaccuracies in the years that we assign to individual fires. And we do know that the trees are often highly stressed after fire, so they might miss a ring or produce an extremely narrow ring that's difficult to, te or to detect. So by matching the patterns of narrow and wide rings, we make sure that we have annually resolved and sometimes seasonally resolved fire scar dates. We also combine that, as said, said with multiple lines of evidence, lots of tree core. Um, information where we're coring trees near the base of the tree rather than at breast height to try to get our best estimate of the age of the trees, aiming to intercept pits of the trees, determining then ages, but also looking at the ring width patterns to understand the growth histories of the trees themselves. The data from those tree cores and fire scars combined, we can put into these fire demography plots. And this is one from one of the lens um, sites over in the, um, the Cranbrook region in southern or southeastern British Columbia. And she's showing here a 300 plus year record where she had initially each of these lines represents the life history of an individual tree in her stand. So we can see that the oldest trees established in the early part of the 1700s in around the 1730s and 40s created a cohort. We had fire scars being recorded in some of those trees. And so we have remnant trees that have survived or veteran trees that have survived fires in the past. We have another cohort that established after the 1911 or 1910 fire. Um, so that's the, the second cohort here. And our stand today then includes trees of a range of sizes with these different types of evidence embedded within the tree rings. 
here's, we can refer to this as multiple lines of evidence when we're looking for ages and scars and growth rates. We can also combine this by looking at what is the composition, what species are actually establishing in these different cohorts through time. When we go back into the past, if we're looking at shade and tolerant species that established at distant points in the past but had very wide rings initially, that's strong evidence that we're looking at a post-fire cohort as opposed to a cohort that might have established after some other agent of disturbance or as just part of a stand development process where we had an old stand not affected by fire for a long period of time. So those are examples of the lines of evidence we might use to make our interpretations. So our research objectives then, taking this new perspective or different perspective, is to come back and look not just at the timing of the fires that gives us fire frequency, but to look at the impacts on stand dynamics to understand fire severity as well. So look for those lines of evidence to interpret the impacts of historic fires on the forest and how that determines both composition and structure of our current stands. In the bigger picture, our, our broader research objective has been to understand fire frequency and severity and to compare them among these mixed conifer stands that we see throughout Western Canada. So our research sites really form this north to south transect going from southern British Columbia up into the Jasper and Foothills area. We also have research sites that are going from southeast British Columbia across a couple of mountain ranges and over now into the Okanagan. So that we're working on windward leeward size of multiple, um, multiple mountain ranges. Our pilot study that I wanted to talk about briefly here is from the Berlin River watershed. And so we get up kind of on the Highway 40 um, north section of the, the um, Foothills Research Institute, the land base that is used for much of the research here at the Institute. And we're on this case, we're up in the Hinton Wood Products Forest Management Area. That's what the lighter gray area is. We used GIS in this case to look for logical to pine dominated stands that had established prior to 1900. And then in the, the vegetation inventory, indicated that there was at least two canopy layers. And so the darker gray patches that you see here represent about 25% um, of the landscape that actually met those criteria. And then we selected from those sites that were easily accessible to do our pilot study. We went in and our standard that we've been using to make sure that all of the projects that we're working on are as comparable as possible, we use one hectare search areas to find fire scars so that we're always looking at a constant um, study area size since the size of the area can influence the number of fires that you encounter and um, interpret. The next is um, we collect fire scarred information as Zev, as Zev said, both from living trees but also from downed logs and snags because they often have embedded in them long um, records of fire. And then we've used what we call an entry sampling design for forest composition and structure. And using the center point of our fire history plots, we look for the 20 nearest canopy trees. And sometimes we also subsample in the sub canopy as well. But the idea here is to try to get an idea of the composition, structure, and age structure in particular of the, the surrounding canopy trees that are linked to and associated with the fire scars that we're collecting. So as you might expect, here's just diameter class distributions of our four sites, and the different bars represent different species. So in each of our six sites that we worked on up in the Berlin area, we had lodgepole pine as the dominant species, and it was the dominant species in terms of size, the largest diameter classes, and dominant in the canopy at all of the sites. And then as you might anticipate as well, there was white and black spruce in the understories. Those are the gray bars of different, um, different shades. And they were typically the smaller trees on the site, certainly understory in terms of their, their height stature. If we describe the shapes of those curves, they tend to be unimodal to bimodal, and they're fairly consistent. I'd say probably site six is the least consistent among them, but you kind of get a peak in around the 25 centimeter class at each of the, the sites. If I look just at these size structures and age structures, I, I might interpret that we had you know pine overstories and then later infilling or a second cohort, second generation maybe, of, of spruce coming in, or perhaps we just had size stratification after a single event, um, certainly at sites one through four. That might have been my interpretation for them. 
Let me show you what the age structures look like. So site number one, we have a very clear cohort that established in the late 1800s. Um, and it is a combination, it had a little bit, um, primarily lodgepole pine, but also some spruce on that site. And then we had one subalpine fir as well. From the cohort, we've inferred that there was a fire sometime before 1886. So looking at the innermost ring of those pines that were open grown with wide rings, we would say a fire burned, um, we're inferring a fire here from the cohort structure. We also have trees on this site, interestingly, that had scars in them that all dated to 1915, and the trees that were burning with those scars were only about three and a half centimeters in diameter. And then at this site, the 1956 fire, which is well documented in the documentary record um, on, and detected in air photos and the like. These were larger trees in 1956. And this is an example of one of the trees then that had the fire in 1915, and then this one actually had an outer ring date of 1956. The death date on this tree co coincided with the fire scars on other trees and the documented fire in 1956. So let me move a little bit more quickly through the others to show you what the other sites look like. So again, a strong cohort. Interestingly, we had remnant dead trees. So the dead trees are not showing up as part of our cohort. This is down charred wood on the ground, all blackened on the outside, kind of scalloped, or you could see it had burned maybe multiple times. And embedded in those trees were fire scars from 1716 and 1756. And there were multiple trees like this that we were able to collect. So here's the 1716 fire scar showing up on multiple trees at the site, and then very eroded and decayed. We don't have a, a, an outer ring date on that one. Um, but it did, it was prior to 1756 when we did look at the, the last ring that we could date on that particular scar, or scar tree. And then again, we're inferring from the cohort structure a fire sometime prior to 1881. We also have on those trees forming that cohort, again, a scar in 1915 showing up on multiple trees and cross dating to exactly the same year of 1915. Site three, two strong age cohorts, pine to the left and spruce to the right. Now, it could be that we had a big stand replacing fire here, crown closure, a little bit of stem exclusion, maybe a little bit of canopy mortality, giving opportunity for the more shade tolerant spruce to come in. We could have then just one fire event, that stand replacing effect, or event, driving some stand dynamics. But again, looking for multiple scars and evidence on the landscape. We have that cohort coming in in the 1820s. And then we do have fire scars preceding that spruce cohort. So here we have fire scars and then creating an opportunity for spruce to establish in the understory. And then again, 1915 showing up on another site. The last one, this is the site that had a broader size distribution and its age distribution is also um, much more broad, and then we see also a cohort in the early to mid um, 1800s. And again, we're inferring maybe, if we go back to those lodgepole pines, there's just a couple of them back there, but they are open grown. We have fire scars in the oldest trees for 1778, again in the 1830s, early 1900s. So here we have a site that was recording multiple fire scars on multiple trees. If I compile them then for the just the six sites, we have each of these um, triangles pointing or giving indication of the beginning of the stand, so the stand initiating cohorts, and then also where we have fire scars that have occurred in the past. Remember, this is the site where we have remnant trees um, that had fire scars embedded on them. If we look at the fire to fire intervals then, so we've inferred where we have cohorts that there must have been a fire just preceding the cohort, and we've looked at the fire scar dates. We can see that fires at these sites had intervals of anywhere from 35 to 167 years. So that's a lot of variability from our, amongst the intervals, but some of them, many of them are quite short, less than 100 years. If we compare the date or the number of years since the last fire recorded, whether it was fire scar or cohort, to the time of sampling, our time since fire then is anywhere from 50 to 123 years. And so in some of these sites, actually exceeding the interval between the fires that we had observed in the fire record. 
And so this is an indication, we see this often in the, in the sites where we have a lot of fire scars and low severity fires, is an indication of a change in the fire regime. And here in the foothills, for these six pilot study sites, we're finding similar evidence. So evidence of both low and high severity fire, and then also longer fire intervals currently at those sites. If we think about them spatially, the first fire was in 1711, and each of the dates will pop up showing how they're distributed through the landscape. For the most part, we only had one fire burning at each of the sites until the late 1800s and into the early 1900s. So I'll highlight the ones where we had fires burning at multiple sites. 1886, 1889, Mike's going to talk about this date a little bit more and it'll show up on the field tour. I think Ralph might have a few things to say about it as well. 1915, 1915 as well. So here what we're getting is um, numerous fires then, many of them only local at one of the sites. And then in other cases, we have fires that were burning in a broader, more widespread fires that were burning and scarring trees at multiple sites. So from the pilot study then, we do have evidence of low to moderate severity fires, the ones that are non-lethal to trees and leaf scars. The fire intervals that we were able to reconstruct were quite a bit shorter than a typical um, stand replacing regime described for this landscape of a fire return interval of 100 years for stand replacing fires is kind of the norm that's been described for the upper foothills. We have uneven age stand structures, so although the diameter distributions are unimodal, the age structures are much more complex than those size structures would, or diameter structures would indicate. And at each of these sites, then, we have mixed severity fire histories, evidence of both higher severity fires that created even age cohorts, but also fire scars that were um, indicating past disturbances of lower severity, past fires of lower severity at each site. So the new burning questions. What did our pilot study lead us to ask? Well, this was just six sites, so I think the most important one is, are these mixed severity fires common to the rest of the landscape? You know, before we start advocating major changes, we need to be able to address this and think about this critically within other forest types in British Columbia. And so Vanessa has been working on this question in the foothills. Her research is, is designed to address this question at the broader spatial scale. Teresa and Raphael have been working in Jasper, and what they've been doing is revisiting existing fire history data sets and update them using modern techniques, using cross-dating, coming up with highly resolved, annually resolved fire scar records, um, linking those to the age structure information, some of it newly collected, some of it existing. Um, and they'll talk a little bit more about their projects in the next couple of moments. 